Oh my god, we're, we're so fucked. <laughs> we're, 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 we, we, the, the, the British left took a big fat L last night. Yo, what up? Welcome to Owls at Dawn. Who? We are just. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we are just two dudes from Southern California who studied philosophy, politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast a week of bullshit with impunity. I am Austin Hayden Smith. And I'm Troy Polidori. And we are very punny today, aren't we, Troy? Yeah, we biffed the intro a little bit, but that's fine. That's kind of, you know, what we do on this podcast. <laughs> So this week we are going to talk some politics. The UK election was last night, so we actually have a ringer who's going to come on, John, a.k.a. the Lit Crit Guy, who is British, who has been a guest previously, is going to come on and break down what happened in the election and what this means moving forward for larger left and socialist concerns in the UK, and then, of course, a little bit about you know, kind of on our side of the pond as well, which is then going to lead us into our main segment. And then we are going to take license and we are going to talk about the British, not the British, the uh, upcoming United States election, since we have not really talked about politics in a while. And Troy was like, well, fuck it. Why don't we just talk about some politics? Yeah? Yeah. All right. Well, let's fucking do it then. All right. So the first thing we got to do on this podcast, as always, is the shitty minute. This is the part of the podcast where one of us rants and raves about whatever it is that's grinding our gears this week. But Austin, you've got a bit of a surprise, don't you? Oh yeah, we had to bring in a ringer for this week because as I'm sure most of our listeners know, the UK election was, well, last night for us now. Um, and uh, so I guess this will be a few days ago for you as you're listening to this. So we had to bring in somebody who's actually British and smart and politically knowledgeable that can help us figure out how to kind of like wade through this mess so we brought in the lit crit guy aka john to come on and help us sort through all this madness how you doing brother uh i've been better i've been better <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i was saying before we started recording that you messaged me like early this morning so either you didn't sleep last night or you just slept very very little uh yeah i slept i slept real bad last night uh uh, and and drank probably slightly too much to, to really do anything about it. Yeah, I bet. So the shitty minute is usually where one of us gets to rant and rave about whatever it is that's pissing us off from the week. So I imagine that this would be your shitty minute, right? So <laughs> have do you, do you need a minute to rant? Do you want to rant for just like one minute? Do you have anything that you just want to say just to get off your chest? Any swear words you need to just let out there? You Go ahead. Uh, oh my god, we're, we're so fucked. <laughs> we're, 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 we, we, the, the, the British, uh, left took a big fat L last night. Um, yeah. it is, it is hard to overstate just how big a kick in the teeth this is. Uh, it is kind of gut wrenching. I saw last six weeks, you've seen like turnout in terms of activists and volunteers some 27,000 people taking time off work like traveling around the country and it got us like one of the biggest tory majorities uh like the biggest one since thatcher and holy shit i didn't i didn't you know we were not hoping for much but my god like that was that was tough when that exit poll dropped and uh you saw just how bad it was predicted to be uh, the one thing I want to get off my chest, though, is um, absolutely fuck the Lib Dems. <laughs> like, mm. uh, just just the biggest wreckers. There were there were, um, you know, uh, people might have, might remember the Grenfell Tower disaster, which is where a, um, a social housing project tower uh, went up in an inferno, and it happened in one of the richest boroughs of London, um, and that. Borough had recently that year elected um, a really impressive Labour MP. Uh, in that constituency, a Lib Dem ran, took 10% of the vote, and now in Kensington, which was a symbol of, of the impact of Tory austerity, 
of the neoliberalization of, of the state and the way in which neoliberalism carries within it a kind of profound violence. Those people who had to watch their friends and family burn to death because the council didn't want to spend the extra money are now going to be represented by a Conservative Party MP. Um, and that is precisely the fault of the Lib Dem. Lib Dems just throwing a wrecking ball into that race out of nothing more than political spite. And they should never be forgiven for that. Okay, to real quick, for American audiences, can you just give us a breakdown? Obviously, it's a parliamentary system. So yeah. the three main parties are the conservative slash Tory party, the Labour Party, and then I guess you would say the Lib Dems, who were in a coalition with the conservative party in 2010 to what, 2015? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, it's a constituency election, and it runs on the first past the post system. So this is this is a really brutal system as well, because if you look at the proportion of votes nationally the conservative party increased their vote share nationally by about somewhere between one and two percent but they ended up with a majority of around 80 politicians clear majority in the house uh in 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 westminster they don't need to reach across the aisle bipartisanship doesn't need to exist all they need to do is keep people in line and get them to vote the right way so you have conservatives you have the labor party led by uh, jeremy corbyn uh, you had the Liberal Democrats who were a kind of third way um, liberal centrist party, interested, very, very pro-EU, interested in kind of mild technocratic social liberalism, um, but absolutely loathed the Labour Party. Um, they, they had uh, nothing but contempt for kind of the Corbyn project. And so in key races, key constituencies that the Labour Party really needed to win, um, the Lib Dems were running candidates that were designed to draw or split um, the vote off from Labour. Um, and, um, and it worked. And it worked. And it got them exactly the result that they said they didn't want, which was Boris Johnson being back in the Houses of Parliament with an increased majority um, and able to do pretty much whatever he wants at this point. So, John, I have a question. Um, the Conservatives have been in power since about 2010, right? Yeah. Um, is it correct to say that this is kind of unique, a unique phenomenon in sort of, you know, like democratic politics of the last 50 years that a party has been in power for almost basically a decade? Uh, people are very dissatisfied with their government, and yet that same party gets overwhelming power in an election. I mean, that's, that is uh, probably not as unique as we think, uh, especially if you look at the kind of nativist semi-coded racial language that conservatives were using throughout this campaign um and the th the the unique event as it were it, and the thing that i think really stymied labor's kind of political mo room to maneuver was was brexit in 2017 the vote to leave the uh, 2016 rather the vote to leave the european union um so the conservative campaign was terrible what they campaigned on was as i say this kind of barely concealed kind of racial language and the the mantra of let's get brexit done and that's all they said that's all they campaigned on and it worked and it worked i i mean so i i don't know if it's if it's totally unique but it is in a way i think it's sort of depressingly familiar hmm. so i've read i've read a few different things online with the commentariat and and then uh, uh, voices that I respect as well, you know, people even like uh, I think is it Paul O'Connell who wrote a piece, and um, I, I've heard people saying that that this was like the Brexit election, right? And then you have other people that say, well, we can't just boil it down to Brexit. There's a larger history of things with you know kind of post industrialization and a lot of if you look at the constituencies that switched, they're Northern English and then some of like the kind of um, dilapidated Welsh regions that. Uh, apparently labor, because they were waffling on certain things, didn't really, uh, I guess, appeal to. I mean, what? let's get into some of the causal explanations here as best we can. Was this simply because labor failed in their campaign to address Brexit because they were kind of trying to talk out of both sides of their mouths? I mean, is that what this is? Is this the Brexit election or is there something, other go uh, uh, something else going on here that we need to look at? I think, I think in many ways... It'd be very easy to go, yes, it is. And absolutely, Brexit pay, played a part. Um, it was very easy to paint Labour as not having a clear position, when in fact, 
if you look at it, it was probably the the one that made the most sense in what was achievable. Uh, but if there is a kind of requirement to kind of get people to pay attention to that, it's very easy for opposition to paint you as, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. And we've got a simple, clear message that we will drive home ad nauseum. But it's incredibly simplistic to say that this is just about something that happened in 2016. This, I think, in many ways is the result of real long-standing factors um, that are tied into the changing demographic of each party's vote. The fact that like huge swathes of the post-industrial North, which were described as like labor heartland territory, switched, yeah. switched and, and, voted, mm. and voted for the Tory party, um, the Conservative party, which oversaw the biggest deindustrialization in British history with Thatcher. Um, so that is a, that's a huge issue. And the danger is that there's a kind of la- the Labour right, uh, you know, those on the right of the Labour Party would say that well, what this means is we have to kind of offer this kind of um, self-interested nativism. That's the, that's the route we have to go down. But that is only ever going to put you on the political terrain of the right, and they will always do it better than you. So... And the kind of centrist, uh, kind of technocratic Blairite model of politics, which was very successful in the in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, people don't want that anymore, and it's not going to work. So, what's needed is is a kind of serious period of of rethinking and re-strategizing, and putting the fact that the kind of mass movement, uh, the Labour Party membership is half a million people. Um, how do you put that to how do you put that to work? How do you kind of reimagine new ways of of kind of building a uh, socialist parliamentary democracy. Mm. I've also seen a lot of people blame the media here. I mean, can we talk a little bit about? I obviously. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, so so in in the age of the internet, like we're all able to access this stuff, but you're immersed in it. What was the shit storm? The media shit storm? Like like how? Why is it that people are so like? Uh, I guess uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They're just so um, – they're targeting the media as being one of like the prime culprits of contributing to misinformation and uh, like kind of like derailing a lot of uh, labor's momentum. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, uh, there was a recent uh, inquiry that found uh, something like 80 to 90 percent of the Conservative Party adverts contained factually incorrect claims. Um, yeah, I heard that. I heard the number was 88%. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, huge amounts of coverage focused on uh, labor scandals and labor problems. Virtually no coverage was given to, to problems within the Tory party, issues of uh, Islamophobia, the racism, the uh, uh, all of the other ways in which the Tory party has kind of monstered its way into power. Um, the British mm. press has, has been consistently uh, opposed to Jeremy Corbyn for the last four years. And a huge amount of the attacks and the vitriol have become the kind of normalized common sense of, oh, well, this, you know, he's too radical, he's dangerous, he's got links to terrorists, he, et cetera, et cetera. He's when anti-Semitic, it, which I thought was, I mean, that was a really prominent one that I saw online quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I don't, I'm not going to downplay the fact that was was and is anti, uh, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party a problem. Yes. Um, but... This became it became a very personalized attack on Corbyn that in mm. his and specifically the fact that his leftist politics made that more uh, prominent within Labour. Hmm. Um, do you think that Corbyn is an inept leader? Um, I mean. In many ways, no. I think I think he's someone who sacrificed an awful lot and put up with an awful lot um, that I think would have destroyed most politicians in half the time. Um, you know, he was elected leader of the party with a massive mandate. There was a huge rebellion against him. He was seen as this outdated figure, marginal fringe. People hated him, so the party rebelled. There was another leadership election in 2017, and he was elected again with an even bigger mandate from the membership. Um, is he a good politician? Yeah, I think so. Yes, is he was was he up against a media apparatus that was determined to kind of do everything it could to make life harder for him? Also, yes. 
but also mm. you know i think there's there's a measure of like you can't argue with results like yeah so no yeah. but no i absolutely don't think he's a he's an incompetent politician i think the fact that he's willing to um stay on and oversee the kind of uh, process of reflection as he called it shows an enormous strength of character that i don't think many people uh in in his position would be able to do because he's going to stick around in this party which huge swathes of it huge swathes of the parliamentary labor party do not like him at all uh and think uh and now they've got even more ammunition to show well this is this is fringe uh radical leftism and it doesn't work whereas if you look at uh if you look at the uh polling on the, like labor's policies hugely well received um but i think there has to be some accountability from the leadership but i also would be really hesitant to say that he's he's you know incompetent or a bad politician he's been an incredibly successful politician and he's come up against the full weight of a media and class appara apparatus that was designed to keep him away from power hmm. so can we add, do the most american thing possible and talk about what this means about us since really <laughs> global politics is ultimately about what it means for america right <laughs> um, does this mean that Bernie Sanders is doomed? Uh, yeah, because the material and political conditions of the UK and America <laughs> are identical, aren't they? <laughs> we do speak the same language. I mean, come on. I mean, yeah, uh, no, uh, absolutely not. Um, it means the stakes are pretty high. And I think if anything, uh, American friends should be looking at the, especially the media aspects of the campaign over those six weeks. And you should pay very careful attention to how was uh, Jeremy Corbyn treated? Because that's exactly what's going to happen. That's it. like it's going to happen again. I mean, the, uh, I don't know if you saw the Federalist a couple uh, of weeks ago. Was it this week? They were. Yeah. They would. Yeah. They put up a test balloon asking whether Bernie Sanders <laughs> could be considered anti-Semitic. Wow. Um, oh, they're going to do it for sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So all of this is going to happen. All of this is going to happen to to mm. to Bernie or whoever whoever the kind of um, uh, nominee for the Democratic Party ends up being, they, they will be relentlessly monstered um, because we've seen it happen here and it can be hugely effective. So my advice would be watch and learn and plan now. What do you think it is about conservative politicians and parties and not needing to be perfect, but that leftists, socialists, they have to be spotless. Like, why is it that we carry the mantle that if we fuck up on one thing, then we're the hypocrites, we're, uh, we're liars, we're dishonest, you know, we get the epithets thrown at us. But you can get someone like Bojo, who's a buffoon, who does not have a stellar track record himself on things that he said, but people can overlook it. You look at someone like Trump. Why is it that that the standard for like principled purity seems to be so much higher for left leaning types. I think it's interesting in the case of um, British politics specifically, because Johnson has the class background that gives you a colossal sense of entitlement. You know, uh, David Cameron, one of the previous uh, conservative prime ministers says that when he was at university, he said he wanted to be prime minister because he thought he'd be quite good at it. Uh, Boris, jo Boris Johnson wanted to be prime minister because he was he thought he was born to it. You know, you have they had there is there is a huge sense of class entitlement uh, among a certain kind of strata of right wing politicians. And the other thing is, you know, I was thinking about this in the context of of um, uh, of Zizek's concept of ideological cynicism. Like people know that Bojo is a failure, right? The people the people who vote for him know. But they, they, they will still do it anyway because they go, well, I absolutely can't, I absolutely can't vote for the other person. And, you know, he, he, he like Trump, is, is entertaining. There's an entertaining... Yeah. So, so you don't want... In fact, the, the hypocrisies don't matter to them because it was never about purity politics. It was about mm. a kind of libidinal investment. It was about being able to slander the opposition as the kind of... Uh, and it's an easy attack, you know. If somebody is a socialist and they've done very well, 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 there you go. You can dismiss them completely. Um, so a few, I think, a multiplicity of factors, right? You you can 
there's a profound ideological cynicism at work. There is a kind of huge class entitlement that means that his own personal failings are are nothing to worry about. There is a, a ruthless political machine behind him, just as with Trump, which will which will constantly uh, seek to secure its own access to power. Um, and um, yeah, there's 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 the belief that. Uh, the other thing I think is the, the belief that this couldn't have gone any other way. Um, you know, capitalist realism. You know, Fisher was writing about yeah. the, the British electorate. Um, he called it the sense of learned helplessness. We've had t mm. ten, ten years, ten years of every major media and political outlet saying austerity is really the only option. Austerity is really the only option. Things can only ever get worse. You know, there is no money. We can't give people all the things that they want. But this is this this is, a, is is an obfuscation of the fact that austerity was and is a choice, and it is a choice carried out in the class interests of a certain demographic of of, of the populace who generally generally will will be uh, inclined to vote with their own class interests, and that's why you know that's why Boris is is uh, you know in many ways I think there are similarities between him and Trump. Hmm. I mean, kind of tying this issue of, of class with the libidinal investment that you mentioned just a minute ago, uh, Todd McGowan talks about how like the Trump voters voted for him because they can kind of like vicariously enjoy through him, right? He has that, that symbol of success. And so even if you are kind of an economically depressed person or you're living in like a post-industrial um, kind of rust belt state or whatever, nevertheless, you can kind of, you somehow can vicariously enjoy through this figurehead uh, that is standing before you. Do you think there's something similar in the UK that like somehow people, even though they're in, you don't have the kind of like Americanism of like aspirational, you know, the American dream kind of thing, there still seems to be this sense in which maybe, or I'm just wondering, is there a sense in which maybe people look at like the upper classes, they look at like the, the nobility, they look at um, someone like Boris Johnson, and it's like, well, that's just right. Like, that's, that's just like, who should be leading the country? Is there some sort of, I think that's uh, not an absolutely, yeah, absolutely part of it. I think that's absolutely yeah. part of it. I also think um, Boris projects this image, like he self consciously manufactures the, the Bojo persona, um, like, <laughs> like bring, bringing tea out to the uh, friggin' uh, the newscasters that are sitting <laughs> in his front yard. Well, they're trying, they're trying to pin him on something, and he's like, oh, he's got his hair's all messed up, and he's in like his PJs, and he brings him tea and yeah. milk or something like that. Yeah, like that's now, a very now, calculated move. It's an incredibly calculated move. Yeah, he is. He is. It, he used to be a journalist, and he's an incredibly good media operator. He's not a very good mm. politician, but he's very good at image, and. Uh, you know, he, he he was a journalist. He there's a there's a record that he constantly is is when he's about to be filmed live on camera, he will deliberately mess his hair up. Um, hmm. He'll do it deliberately. He'll kind of ruffle his hair, even though you know hair and makeup have tried to make him look presentable. Um, <laughs> but he's in, he's incredibly he's incredibly aware of what he's doing, and the media sees him as a figure of entertainment. Interesting. Um, I'll give you a really good example. I'll give yeah, you a really yeah, really do. quick example. So. During the Brexit referendum, Boris went around the country with a huge red bus saying that um, we send $350 million every week to the EU. Let's spend it on the NHS instead. That was a lie. Um, yeah. So in the lead up to this election, and he was asked, what do you do to relax? Which is the softest of softball questions. And he invents this story about painting model buses out of cardboard boxes. So that now, if you Google Boris bus or Boris Johnson's bus, what you'll find is you'll find, oh, isn't he wacky and adorable? You won't find the analysis of the fact that he lied to win the uh, EU referendum. So he's very mm -hmm. deliberate. Like, that's, that's all planned and it's all consciously uh, plotted out. You know, he's become an entertainment figure. Uh, so mm -hmm. people, this is, I, so I, I absolutely think there is a degree of kind of, there's the class angle here that he kind of comes from that privileged uh, background. And I think on a deep level, there is a degree to which it's true that people look at him and go, actually, yes, you know, it makes sense to have someone like that running things. Um, mm. But also, I do think it, it's, it's a creation of a media persona that a lot of journalistic reporting on him plays into and magnifies.
Okay, so this is the shitty minute, so it can't go too long, and I know we gotta let you go. So, Troy, do you have any questions? I know you were asking me stuff earlier about, like, the future turning towards that thing that you want to pin to John here. Yeah, so really quick, just so maybe to garner a little bit of hope at the end of the shitty, uh, shitty 30 minutes here. Um, is there some hope in the, in the sense that, and I'm, I'm just kind of grasping for straws here, the Tories are now going to be responsible for Brexit and whatever comes after it. And so there's some sense in which, and I, people have talked about this in terms of uh, the next American election, like a recession's coming. Do you really want to be the party in power when it happens, right? And gets blamed for it. Um, or is that is that really just uh, trying to find a silver lining where it doesn't exist? Uh, to be blunt, I think that's trying to find a silver lining where one doesn't exist. Um, like the, the Tories were already responsible for Brexit. Like that was already something that they were they were dealing with, and now they've got the mandate to go. Well, we can do this exactly the way that we wanted to, that satisfies the most right wing elements of conservative politics. I think um, I think this is this is a very uh, worrying time, uh, and I think the the kind of vision, the myopic vision of of Brexit is going to be is that's what was sold to people, right? We're going to we'll be out, it'll be done, it'll be over, and then you know we'll be the one nation under a conservative overlord. Um, the elements of hope I think that are there are the fact that those half a million members are not going away, the fact that huge amounts of people did not and won't vote conservative. Um, and that there are, you know, uh, hopefully thousands upon thousands of people who've been radicalized by this rather than letting it push them into despair. Um, the fight goes on, you know, uh, if if Labour would have won the election, the, the, the fight would have gone on anyway. We lost. We're going to have to go c carry on fighting anyway. You know, the British socialist Tony Benn said that there is no great final victory. There is no great final defeat. There is the struggle and the struggle goes on day after day. And you've got to you've got to toughen up. Because uh, it's going to be, it's going it, to, it lasts forever, and you've got to just play your part. Hmm. Um. So Corbyn has he officially stepped down? <clears throat> so he said he isn't going to do that immediately. He wants to lead the party through a period of reflection, working out what went wrong and ways forward. Um. It's probably a sensible idea because it means he'll have some involvement over choosing who's going to be the next Labour leader. Um. And as I said, I think that's an incredibly brave move. Um, I'm not sure I would have done that in his position. Um, mm. But he he, he, and the kind of like uh, nascent left within the party are pretty well placed. You know, they're not going anywhere, right? They're not going to go anywhere anymore. The okay. policies, um, you know, the, the, the kind of structures of the party, there, there are huge problems, obviously, but there are kind of left-leaning figures uh, involved with all of those aspects so uh, Jeremy Corbyn I think is going to return to the backbenches uh, probably in months rather than weeks um, but it depends on how quickly that goes but a kind of the left wing project I don't think is finished yet okay yeah that was going to be my next question I mean it's all well and good to be hopeful but at what point is that a naive optimism and and in what sense are there like the real conditions in place that can take root and that can that can flower after a defeat like this? To be honest, I I don't know yet, and I don't think it's 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 very very fresh. So what has to happen is there has to be, you know, there's the the kind of leftist cliche, don't mourn, organize. But I think we're going to have to do both at the same time, <laughs> um, and we're going to have to kind of strategize and 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 mourn what could have been simultaneously so i mm. think understanding the causes is going to be complex and important um and actually figuring out what what can we what can cook within it within a parliamentary democracy system which is um increasingly stacked against left-wing voices or left-wing points of view what can be done and what and more importantly what can be done outside of that system in terms of building uh, alternative bases of power in order to materially improve the conditions of people. Yeah. Okay. And then I guess that's, this will be the last thing I want to say. I know we could, we could end on a positive and hopeful note, but I kind of want to do something the opposite. What does five years Brexit, Tory control, what does that look like? And then this actually might inspire people to 
take to the streets more and to start to organize and to become more politically inclined because like let's heighten um the situations of exigence that are going to inevitably result or at least what we think is go are going to inevitably result from five more years of Tory government. And not only that, but a strengthened and legitimized Tory government that is now going to be more proactive in dismantling the welfare state and various other things. So like, what is this going to look like? Well, uh, when I, when I saw the, when I saw the um, exit poll, I just tweeted, well, hell world it is then. Um, <laughs> and if, if that's, if that's what it is, then, then here's what some of the kind of best guesses at the moment probably talking millions more uh, children, especially living uh, way below the poverty line. You're probably talking the increasing privatization and uh, market model of healthcare being introduced into the NHS. You're probably talking a redrawing of constituency boundaries um, to make it harder for um, uh, conservatives to be voted out of office. You're probably talking about the introduction of um, a national ID registry, which will be factored into voting rights. Um, you're probably talking about a, a pretty, pr the, the best guesses as far as I've, uh, from the stuff I've read is about a four to 5% contraction in the economy, thanks to a Brexit. Uh, we're probably talking about uh, the loosening of workers' rights, making, pe making businesses in inverted commas more flexible, um, increasing zero hours contracts, the gig economy will become ever more entrenched. Um, mm. crack, crackdowns on unions, like join a union. If you are in the UK listening to this, join a trade union um, because the only way that we get through it together is if we fight together. And if we fight together, then we might just win. Mm. Well, um, I know it isn't exactly the most enjoyable thing probably for you to rehash and relive. I'm sure over the next couple of days, this is going to just be dominating your thoughts, but you know, thanks for coming on and kind of debriefing us a little bit. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, thank you for letting me kind of get it all off my chest. <laughs> yeah. If there's, if, if you need to just scream fuck right now, you know, please. <laughs> we do that ahead. on this podcast. Yeah. Fucking stories. <laughs> I know, you know, what's so funny, man, like the C word cunt is a word that just hurts coming out of me because in, a, in the United <laughs> States, we don't say it too often, but if it is so appropriate, the Tory cunts, it just flows together, doesn't it? So. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, comrades. And, All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks, brother. Have a good day. Yeah. Thanks, John. All right, so thanks so much to John for uh, Liquor Guy for coming on, and talking a little bit about this uh, UK election results. As, as sad as it is, the mourning process, uh, as John said, is important, and the time of reflection is important, and is good for you know producing that motivation later on to uh, uh, to reverse these trends, right? Yeah, exactly. So should we talk a little bit about uh, what this might mean for U.S. politics? Yeah, I mean. I it's interesting because in 2016, you had the Brexit vote and then you had the Trump election and they were oftentimes spoken in the same breath, right? Because it did seem that there was some commonality there. So I guess in what the sense- surprising results, first of all, right? Yeah, surprising results. I mean, I guess surprising from some people's perspective, right? Yeah, from one perspective, yeah. Yeah. So surprising results and then maybe even like some similar tendencies, you know, like the rise of ethno-nationalism, et cetera, et cetera, things like that that got talked about. Um, so what do you think here? Like what what are your initial thoughts on if there is some sort of cross-resonance for what this might mean as a larger symptom, a larger political symptom in the West? Yeah, there's there's so many things that I'm thinking about after what John said. I think the most important thing, though, is to not be too uh, motivated to make uh, neat analogies between what's happening in the UK and what could happen in the US next year. Um, given that, you know, the material and political realities of the two nations is extremely different, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Brexit thing being the most important, probably, or maybe not the most important, but a big part of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, it seems like the you know get or done mentality around Brexit was a big part of the Tories you know winning the majority here. It seems like I guess people felt that that Corbyn's platform is nuanced and maybe 
correct as it was, um, seems to have pissed off the leavers and the remainers, or enough of them, um, for them to lose this badly. And that's just not the case uh, when it comes to like Sanders and Warren, but especially Sanders being kind of the analog with Corbyn here, right? Yeah, uh, he's the most popular politician in the country. That's very different, um, and they don't have this this uh, kind of unique uh, Brexit factor uh, in the U.S. that could really make this weird political reality come about. Do you think that the impeachment trials will have any bearing at all? You know what's so strange, man? I like hear nothing about the impeachment trials compared to remember when Bill Clinton and the whole Monica Lewinsky scandal was going on. That was like the only yeah. thing that the news was talking about. This seems to be well, like you, you just don't watch MSNBC, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe that's it. But still, like, that's the left channel. Like, you would you would expect them to do that. But I just remember, and I was a kid when those impeachment hearings were going on, and it was like all anybody was ever talking about. And I feel like, and, and again, maybe I am just not tuned into the right places, but I do feel like this is much less stakes than than but previous. Everyone days. just knows the outcome, right? Is that, isn't that part of it? Yeah, maybe. Do you think that's it? So, like, do you think the, this will have any bearing on the election? Well, there's no mystery, right? Like, uh, in terms of wondering what's going to happen, you know, obviously we were, I think, too young during the Clinton trials to really have a in-depth, nuanced uh, understanding of the like political machinations that were happening. But I think everyone just kind of knows that he's probably going to be impeached and then he's probably, and then he's definitely not going to get convicted by the Senate. So it's kind of a pro forma thing that's happening, which doesn't mean that it's good or bad necessarily. Uh, I think we just don't know, right? Like there's people on the left that I think are really uh, intelligent and smart and strategic and disagree on whether or not the impeachment thing is going to help or it's going to hurt and to what degree it might be the case that making republicans in the senate actively and publicly side with trump is going to hurt them in 2020 it could also mean that all we're talking about in 2020 during the campaign is impeachment stuff and not about real issues so i mean and it yeah. could be both those things so i i just i don't know what degree each of them will have will play a factor in addition to other um, things as well yeah, that's that's something I was thinking about a lot today was the effect of like the cultural turn and the culture war on these larger socio-political concerns. And I wonder if like the impeachment trials are going to just be used as some sort of media spectacle to feed into this deepening culture division, cultural division or set of cultural divisions so that it just makes it seem like, oh, you got the crazy loony lefties who are just going to do anything they can to try to get their way. But they're just fucking crazy because they're hysterical. You know, they're hysterical about climate change. They're hysterical about Trump and they're obsessed with Trump. And the weird thing is, is they're not going to be wrong across the board. There is some hysteria on the left about certain issues, right? But that that's only going to kind of like strengthen and deepen their resolve to kind of like just continue to vote. But it's not going to be based on, you know, economic issues. It's not going to be based on policy issues. It's going to be at the level of emotion. It's going to be at the level of sensationalism. And it's going to be at the level of cultural concerns, media cultural concerns. So that's kind of what I, I wonder if. If this is just kind of just another instance that is making politics pageantry. Yeah, I definitely share that concern. You know, I think if there's one thing we can be, we can be sure of about the um, kind of emotional resonance of uh, the whole impeachment to election scenario, it's that we should really care a lot more about motivating people who don't normally vote and who haven't voted to vote than we should about trying to convince um, Republicans to jump uh, from Trump and, and, and vote for a Democrat. Mm. Um, that's the path towards forming a coalition um, and winning, whoever the nominee is, especially if it's Sanders or Warren. Um, and so if we if we think that the impeachment stuff is going to basically just be a show trial, uh, and it's going to sort of dissuade people from wanting to be part of a political movement because they just see it as this ridiculous TV spectacle, then that I think has some some you know negative things to say about the whole impeachment thing. But if it's more of a, hey, like make um make Republicans side with Trump publicly. He's very unpopular. That's a very good thing um to make them uh, to make them do. And then promote a candidate who clearly has this veneer of 
you know, uncri- or not encryptability, but like of not being corrupt, right? Of just being someone who uh, actively wants to sort of remove um, the problem at the heart of uh, politics. And Trump is like the greatest symptom of that. Hmm. Um, that's a pretty narrow road to navigate, right? Um, like how do you, how do you like manipulate the message about impeachment to be about that and not about like protecting Joe Biden or whatever, mm. um, or protecting the fail sons of famous politicians. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the, at the very least, I, I would think that that has to be kind of our, uh, guiding principle. You think? Yeah. I mean, I, it, there's always this information that comes out that talks about the shifting demographics and where people stand. It's like people under the age of 35 or something like that are overwhelmingly in favor of socialism. And the problem is, is how do you get them to vote? And I think I saw something too about um, the numbers actually for young women have been really poor in voting. Did you see that? Have you? Am I, no, I don't think so. I swear, people correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought I saw that that it was particularly like younger uh, millennial women who I I found that to be very surprising because um, if if you've spent any time organizing uh, with like left leaning uh, community groups or activist organizations or anything like that. They're oftentimes very strong and very often led by uh, by women um, participants, right? So I found that very strange that that like across the board that they were kind of like weaker in terms of numbers. But th- that could be wrong. I maybe I may have misread it, but that'd be interesting for someone to kind of like double check for us. But but anyway, we do know that like people under the age of thirty five, let's say people under the age of forty, the millennial, and then like maybe like the Zoomer, I guess, because they can vote, right? Um, the Zoomer age group do tend to to lean left. So the question is, is like, how do you get them to vote? And this is something people always talk about. You know, MTV had their fucking rock the vote campaign that they were just trying to get people to vote. But that was so funny because that was just like, <laughs> just go vote. It wasn't vote for, you know, progressive policies, vote for the progressive candidate. It was, hey, like you have a voice. It's your democratic right. Just go out there and do it. And then it was kind of like this, you know, mealy mouthed liberal and then be respectful of people across the aisle kind of thing. Cause they just wanted to get people to go out and vote, which was kind of interesting, but like, how do you get people inspired towards leftist politics, which is, I think what you really mean, right? So how do you do that? Not just get people yeah. to go out to the polls. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right that, you know, the, the kind of like Gen X nineties MTV rock the vote thing is, is basically if there is any argument for it or motivation for it, it's like a, this is what a good uh, citizen of a democracy does, right? Like a responsible citizen does, like appealing mm-hmm. to someone's notion of like responsibility towards their uh, fellow citizens and towards their country or whatever, right? Right. But like that's, um, well, that's still maybe true now. Um, that's certainly not going to be the like motivating, the strongest motivating factor towards voting. Like the strongest motivating factor is like if you think that that we're headed for doom, <laughs> you should you should vote because this is a, a pivotal uh, moment in the country and in the world's history, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so yeah, that that should be the motivating factor, and you and you can't really make that a motivating factor without having some partisan conclusions about that, obviously, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, that's I think. If anything, and I don't want to be too hopelessly optimistic here, but that seems to be a, a benefit towards Sanders, right? Because he has the ground game and the people um, that are actually going door to door and and meeting with people and and talking about these issues and trying to motivate them towards understanding the importance of the 2020 election as being about you know sort of somewhat impending doom. Yeah. Um, and no other candidate really has that, right? Um, other candidates might have support of, you know, a lot of older Americans from Biden to Buttigieg, right? Or they may have the support of, you know, wealthy elite technocrats like Warren does. But Sanders is the only one who seems to really appeal um, to the broad base of people who normally vote Democrat. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's still a million things that could go wrong and could stop him from getting the nomination. But if if he gets it, it's going to be because of that, right? I mean, I think the thing that is so impressive about his campaign 
is how, and normally you would think that people wouldn't like this because it would be stale and boring, but how one note he is. Like, he is just on message, consistent since the fucking 1970s, right? But his campaign has not wavered. The thing that people are criticizing Corbyn for is their position on Brexit in 2017 when they made their huge gains was, hey, we're just going to make it the best Brexit we can. And then there was all this talk about a second referendum and people didn't like that. And then you have like people who were like the Lexit types, left exit types. And so they were like leavers, but they were in the Labour Party. And then that moment or that kind of movement gained a little momentum. So you have this weird fracturing in the Labour Party. And then, of course, Corbyn and the Labour Party started to officially then say, well, OK, well, maybe we'll soften on our position a little bit, um, you know, of the second referendum. But it was too little too late is what people are saying. So the thing is, is. Sanders doesn't have that. He is just so fucking consistent. There's none of this back and forth and I, we might do this, we might try this, whereas all the other candidates are all over the place, right? And, I mean, fucking Trump, he can't stay consistent for a fucking sentence, let alone a campaign. So that doesn't matter. But, I mean, from Buttigieg to Warren, I mean, even she's flip-flopping on things, right? So, like, or softening, like, she'll come out, like, really hard on something and then she's like, well, let's kind of, like, walk it back a little bit, right? So he seems to be so impressively, singularly focused that I actually think that that's a really strong maneuver, political maneuver, because people know what they're getting. And the one note is also something that resonates with people because it hits them right in their core, because they understand that it has to do with their well-being and their family's well-being, and their neighbor's well-being. And then even if it's not their neighbor, they're expanding their empathy circle, let's say, and they realize it's the neighbor of their neighbor's well-being. And so people can latch on to that. And that, I think, is the great boon to his campaign. Is neighbor a transitive uh, relation? Like, if you're the neighbor <laughs> of my neighbor, are you therefore my neighbor? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's like, you know, they always do that thing. If you've kissed this person, that person's kissed that person, then you've kissed that person. So yeah, we're all neighbors. <laughs> Cosmopolitanism, baby. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that, I mean, it's, it's pretty easy to stay consistent when you don't have to, when the people that you're actually responding to are the base who already agrees with your positions, right? Then you can stay consistent because you're responding to them. Mm -hmm. Whereas other, you know, uh, other candidates are, they're not appealing to a broad base of of uh, supporters that are appealing to the Democratic Party establishment, and that yeah, means, exactly, as well as the voters. So they're kind of navigating um, the negotiation between those those special interest groups. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you can. It's pretty easy to point out to people: look, who's been consistent on their message for uh, fifty years, and who changes their positions all the time. Because the people who change their positions all the time are doing so because they are not actually holding the principle, and they're not beholden to. Um, the people who are going to vote for them. That's really easy to point out. I don't care what any of these candidates say at any moment in time. Just look at who they're actually um, following orders from, right? That's the number one factor you should point to. And I think that's a pretty winning message to most mm. people. But that said, if that's the optimistic take uh, in comparing what's happened to Corbyn with what, what could happen to Sanders, the pessimistic take, I think, would be something like, Look, Corbyn created or Cor Corbyn was involved in a split in the Labour Party, right? Mm -hmm. Between Remainers and Leavers and this kind of complicated idea of a second referendum uh, where you could vote to remain or for the negotiated Brexit. And people seemingly didn't want to do this over again, right? They just wanted to like get her done. Yeah. Um, a similar split could happen in the Democratic Party if Sanders is, becomes the head of it, right? He has not been a Democrat other than when he's running for president for, you know, um, two years out of the last uh, five or whatever. Um, he could cause a split. Like the Democratic Party could decide, look, Sanders is, is our nominee. He wins the, he wins the, uh, the, the nomination um, through the delegate process. But we'd rather lose the election than have he and his ilk take over the party. So yeah. we'll sabotage it. I do not think that that's impossible at all. And mm -hmm. I think, in fact, it may even be likely if you look at who actually runs the party and the fact that they don't seem to care as much about winning as they care about having control over the party. I mean, it is worth noting, too, that there's also a similar split that I think is analogous in 
uh, the Labour Party. And I think this fits too because this really relates to the um, emergence of, let's say, institutionalized uh, neoliberalism in the two great Western powers when you have the Clinton campaign and then you have New Labour, the Blairites, right? And so then with the with the emergence of Corbyn and then on the other side of the pond with the emergence of Bernie Sanders, you get uh, an, a, a push left, but you still have those old Clintonites or those old center lefts or those old Blairites, those old new labor types um, that are kind of like in the party. So there's already a fracturing in the labor party, right? And there's already a fracturing mm. the Democratic Party. And then here's what's so strange. Like, the Tory party, they can be fractured all they want, but for some reason, they just put that shit aside. Can the Republicans do the same thing? Like they kind of had a split, you know, when you had the Tea Party and they like primaried all of those uh, congressmen and stuff like congressmen and women and stuff like that. There was kind of that, but that seems to have been tamed a little bit. And it's like the party kind of just coalesces, even though they have all these fracturings between, you know, evangelical Christians and then reformed Christians and then like Wall Street bros and whatever else. But they kind of are like, yeah, fuck it. Let's just stand behind the flag, you know, of, of the, the Republican flag, and let's just support our candidate. So they kind of, it doesn't seem to affect them as much negatively as the splits do in the Dem party or maybe in the Labor party did, you know? Yeah, but isn't, isn't the reason for that, and maybe this is too simplistic an analysis, but I think it gets to the heart of at least the issue, that the split in the Republican party from, you know, the Tea Party versus like the more moderate Republicans, um, you know, half a decade ago, they were split on cultural issues. They weren't really split on the kind of economic base issues, right? Mm -hmm. It was still all coming from um, support from like the Grover Norquists and the Koch brothers and stuff like that, right? So their split was basically, do we accomplish our economic goals by appealing to these cultural issues or do we stay more moderate um, and go with like, you know, the moral progression of society or whatever and just focus on economic issues and let them have the culture stuff? Um, well, they still have the same economic goals, right? Mm. Um, the the exact split in the Democratic Party is over those economic goals. That's right. right? That's a very good point. And so if that's the base thing, you can't really ultimately fall under the flag of, you know, whatever we say about the cultural issues, we have the same economic goals. So let's go with that in the end. And the cultural issues will just kind of go, you know, piecemeal. Um, whatever parts of the country want to you know, fight over those, they can do it. But you know, New York and, and California, we're not, not going to focus on that, those things or whatever. Would you even go so um, far as to say it's the inverse, that um, in the Democratic Party, it's the cultural issues that are kind of common, but the economic issues that are divided? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, the split is over those economic goals. But I mean, but I mean, the it's cultural like, issues it's, are yeah, the, pretty much agreed. Yeah. Pretty much, right? Like everyone in the Democratic Party is like, cool with gay marriage, you know, uh, uh, women's bodily autonomy. Um, they're kind of like, whatever else the cultural issues are that the conservative party were fighting against, they're kind of like, yeah, we're kind of all cool with that. So it is kind of the inverse of one another. Yeah. And of course it's, it's obviously not a neat binary, right? Because m many of those cultural issues are, are created by the economic you know, base issues. Um, and I think only really the left of the democratic party acknowledges that or recognizes that you can't really fight the cultural issues unless you also fight um, the economic issues, right? Yeah. Um, whereas it seems a little bit more like the like moderate Democrats want to sort of uh, signal about the cultural issues, like oh, we are you know we're for like raising people um, or you know people of color out of poverty or, or having equal, equal representation or equality of opportunity and stuff like that, right? Yeah. But you know, really just kind of signaling at those issues where the cultural and economic stuff overlap. Um, whereas you know the left actually wants to address those things by addressing many of their economic causes. Hmm. Interesting. So, I mean, if you were going to forecast this, obviously, without having uh, any sort of prophetic powers, what do you think's going down, man? Like, what's, what's the tide feeling like? Dude, I have no idea. I'm clearly in an echo chamber of, you know, leftist voices. Like, <laughs> you know, it, if you asked me a few months ago, I would say, oh, for sure, like, the late labor is going to win. It'll probably be close, but you know, people have to hate Johnson and the Tories, right? Like all you hear is how much of a buffoon Johnson is and how the Tories are re responsible for, you know, they've been in power for 10 years. They're responsible for the maladies that have existed. How could this not be like 08 in the United States? Right. Mm. Um, and that clearly is just not a very nuanced take on, on the issues and then what actually motivates people 
um, to vote in the UK, uh, um, kind of uh, in the current situation that they're in. I, I obviously think we have a little bit more of a nuanced take on American politics, given that you know we're kind of embedded in it and we know a lot of the figures in the history. But it could go any way, man. Like, you remember how surprised we were in 2016? How we did like that that like three hour podcast where we had all of our buddies on to mourn and react to the the total surprise of what had happened. Yeah. Um, damn, we had a podcast in 2016. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, that was a long time ago. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, man. No one does like literally anything could happen. There's so much up in the air. There's so many factors. It's not a thing you can just predict based upon the limited information that we have right now. Bro, do you feel differently? Or I mean, even, even if you're the in the, I mean, even if you're in the inner circle, like fucking John Podesta was here in Sydney a few months ago. And he said that he thought Beto was the guy that the democratic establishment would get behind and they oh, yeah. would push him through. And now he's gone. Nate Silver was saying the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, like there's the, the flavor of the month is obviously Buttigieg, right? Um, Biden's still holding strong. And then you've got Warren and Sanders. Um, you know, what's just so strange. Like this isn't prognosticating. I think that there is something fundamentally dysfunctional about how long the American presidential campaigns go oh, on. Yeah, for sure. Because it feels like to me that it has been one continuous campaign since 2000, what, 14? Like, it probably has going to be forever, yeah. I mean, maybe it was before that too, and maybe I just wasn't as politically like attuned. But it feels like since 2014, in the build up to the 2016 election, and then constantly since 2016, like it was just campaigning. It hasn't stopped. So we're talking five years. So it'll be six years of straight campaigning. That's what it feels like. And I wonder if even people who are canvassing for Bernie, I haven't been in the country for much of that time at all but i wonder if they feel like that they're like no it doesn't feel that way we literally have been campaigning for six years you know um but there is something fundamentally dysfunctional about how long this campaign process goes on you know um and then obviously with the sensationalized media um that it it, it makes the news cycle it's not a 24-hour news cycle it's a 30 second fucking news cycle, you know? Um, so it's, you get just these constant spikes that kind of, it's almost like, I think Walter Benjamin talks about like the anesthetization of society and how you have like these bright lights that uh, are need to kind of like awaken you from that anesthetized state. But the problem is, is what happens when you become accustomed to those bright lights, then you need brighter lights and brighter lights or greater shocks or whatever, right? I feel like that's kind of what's going on with this and then so what i wonder is if we're in this anesthetized state but this like heightened anesthetized state like what does that mean for the future of politics if these campaigns are always taking place at such like a fever pitched level of sensationalism like what where the fuck does it go from here and then what does that mean in terms of like the value and the legitimacy of these political campaigns are they just are they destined to just be heightened emotional political pageantry forever because we have been lulled into comas so to speak yeah i mean i think you're exactly right that it is this um kind of heightened pageantry that then because it's it's so constant it just anesthetizes you to sort of the real value of, of what underlies um the surface level stuff right but then doesn't that also mean that it's that much easier to unplug from it like I mean, as an actual politician, like what, what Sanders can do is he can he can unplug from that and just say, I don't care about the sensational bullshit. I'm just going to talk to you, right? I'm just going to talk to you about the real issues that, that face you in your daily life uh, revolving around like paying for health care or having a uh, uh, child leave when you have a kid or, um, you know, making sure you retire with enough money uh, to live and not be a burden to your kids and stuff like that. Like he can really talk to people at that level um, because – Nobody likes this, right? Nobody but the most sycophantic, psychopathic, crazy asshole, you know, um, 
uh, what's his name from American Psycho? Uh, what? Bateman. Yeah, Patrick Bateman. Nobody but that guy enjoys <laughs> this process, right? And, those, and everyone knows that those people are psycho, right? People who have like MSNBC or CNN or whatever on 24 hours a day, these people are nuts, right? So it, it's easy to see that and to, and I think to at least, at least like conceptually unplug from it and say, I want something different. So two things. One, optimistically, I like what you're saying. And that actually really reminds me of Agamben's notion of destituent power. Or we could say like this idea of kind of like um, being an active force rather than a reactive force, right? Like creating and carving out a space of power that is outside of this other regime of power and creating power domains in other ways by not getting caught up in the hysteria, in the sensationalism. I like that. To play devil's advocate, the pessimistic side of me says, but maybe that just means that people will think that he just doesn't know how to play ball because he can't speak the language of the political pageantry and therefore he's going to lose on some certain um, domains that will then kind of make his campaign just a little bit impotent. Not impotent in the literal sense because I think that I could – we could still say that there is that destituent power that is legitimate, that that active power that is legitimate. But in terms of winning at the general level, is it enough? Or will there still be like, will it just not be sexy enough or flashy enough? Or will it not play into the language game of political pageantry enough to be able to win? That would be the pessimistic side. Yeah, and I think that's a legitimate worry. Um and you know what? I'm not optimistic. I don't think it's likely that Bernie <laughs> wins the nomination, and becomes oh, president. Man. You don't. But that's. But that said, you know what? I think what something John said about the Labor Party, I think, is important to keep in mind here. You know, Corbyn's. If Corbyn has a good legacy in the end of this whole thing in 50 years, it won't be anything revolving around obviously this election, right? Because this is the huge L. But it will be around uh, the Labor Party. Like, what is it? Tripling its membership yeah. since he's been the leader. Yeah, I think of dues paying members um that would be the same for bernie right uh even if he somehow does win and become president his legacy will not be the fact that he passed all of his preferred policies with a huge mandate in his like four years in office or whatever before he's like croaks it will be because this movement that built around him um is it's, it's long lasting right it's people who are committed to this movement much much more beyond just Sanders as a figurehead himself, be behind the principles and the ideas and the policy goals um, of that movement and the different way of doing politics that we're talking about. That's not going away, right? People don't just do that for a summer and then all of a sudden like give up, right? It's like, like you, you ever known somebody who was like a Slayer fan for like a summer? <laughs> no, dude, those people fucking carve Slayer into their arms, right? Um, <laughs> like they're right or die. Yeah. So you pe I think people who follow Sanders are, are pretty right or die about the movement. Um, and you can't say the same thing about the other candidates, uh, obviously. They're placeholders. They're intermittent figures. Um, so even if the likely thing happens and Sanders doesn't win the Democratic Party establishment, snuffs him out or uh, literally or figuratively, um, whatever happens, it's the movement that behind him and beyond him that will be the lasting legacy here. And this is, it should be the most important focus too, right? We're not like – celebrating a figure or doing some like celebrity worship of this old Jewish man with the funny hair and the crazy accent who yells so much. Mm -hmm. It's about the movement and the principles. Uh, and that's not going away, I don't think. So this is Limp Biscuit versus Slayer is what you're saying. Like you can have a summer where you're into Limp Biscuit, but then that fades away. But if you're into Slayer, you're in it for the long haul. You're a fucking commie forever. Sorry. Deal with it. Yeah. Everyone, everyone remembers the, uh, uh, chocolate, whatever, in the hot dog flavored water. Like chocolate that was, that starfish. Summer chocolate fun, starfish, right? baby. <laughs> <laughs> One summer you did it all for the nookie, but then you got a little serious and started getting into some prog, right? That's right, man. Okay, I got a question then about this whole issue about being principled. So there was some debate online today, and it made me think a lot about this, where someone was saying, like, you know, we may have lost, and this was a prominent figure. I think I know the name, but I don't want to say it just in case it wasn't. But a pretty prominent like left journalist type, young left journalist type, was saying like, you know, we lost, but I'd rather be principled and know that we stuck to our principles and stuff like that. And then there was like a little bit of debate underneath it that's like, yeah, but fuck your principles, man. You fucking lost, right? So here's what I wonder. 
Like at what points is being at what point does being principled need to give way to just taking power? Now I don't want to go take this too far because I do have a friend also who's a colleague who would kind of maybe lean a little bit too far to that other side that it's just about taking power. Who gives a fuck about your principles? Just win, right? So what do you think about this tension? Is there a tension between being principled, being ethical, like having quote unquote morals, having your principles? Is that overly moralizing? Is that a, a good position to espouse? Or do you think um, that it should be more about taking power and just fucking winning? I mean, I, I just, I, I can't stand the idea of putting those things in tension to the way that they're put in tension, right? It's always such a myopic, narrowly focused, um, really just, uh, I think, impractical and um, and ultimately not a very nuanced take on on things like achieving justice in society or something like that, right? Like, if your ultimate goal is to create a better world, then you're not going to do it by doing wrong things, right? Because <laughs> then you'll you'll make the world worse. The, um, a person who looks at a tr like a you know, tragic political outcome like this and says, "You know what? It sucks, but I'd rather be on the right side of things than um, than be on the wrong side and, and win." Right? They're not saying that they that they don't want to have power. Obviously, you do because you want to make things better. Like things are worse when when the when the bad people are in power, bad policies are being enacted. Right? Right. Um, there isn't, there isn't this this like TV show twenty four style Michael Bay style like I had this ultimate um, like moment in my life where I had to decide between my principles and like saving a bunch of people's <laughs> lives right well well no if your principle is that you should save people's lives then that's the principle right? yeah. or but what um, if your principle is to take power and fucking win yeah I mean, and if you do that if you do that by actually giving up on your principles then you're not going to make the world better. <laughs> right, just be a fucking you don't actually have those principles in the first place. Shit. Yeah, yeah. Really, the beautiful soul stuff is usually these people who do want to just get power, um, so they can, uh, uh, like Machiavellian style, uh, do what's necessary. Right, like yeah. um, all the Obama nuts who wanted to like reenact West Wing in their minds, um, in power. Like that's the beautiful soul stuff, man. I don't think that. That sort of the like moralistic side of the left, the quote unquote moralistic, I hate that term, um, as if we shouldn't be moral, right? Um, or shouldn't be motivated by like our moral principles. They're not beautiful souls. Like they're the most pessimistic people on the planet, dude. None of us think we're going to win. <laughs> hmm. Holy shit, right? Um, so I, I don't think that that like um, the beautiful soul uh, accusation holds any weight to whatever. It's a totally false dichotomy. Mm. Um, it's really just, uh, offered by people who I think are either angry. And so they're kind of like lashing out. And so you can kind of forgive them for that. Cause sometimes it's appropriate to lash out and be upset or it's coming from a cynical, uh, side of people who really don't have any principles, um, and just want to have power, um, to like enact whatever fever dream that they have. Uh, and that should be recognized for what it is and should be rejected for that reason. Mm. I don't know. Do you have a more nuanced take than I do other than just being angry about that accusation? <laughs> Um, I think it's something I, I want to consider more because I, yeah, I, I think that the dichotomy is problematic because precisely what you're saying is if you are principled, you're principled, but you're principled and you want other people to, or you want that, your principled concerns to spread. And that is, uh, an implicit admit admission that you want power, right? Like if you want it to spread, then it spreads by power. It doesn't necessarily That's mean... then your principle. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. So, um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I do think that it, it is a, it, it's a false like dichotomy or tension oftentimes. Um, but I also don't know because I don't, I don't know. It, it's, it's something that I want to think through more because I guess my concern is is that it's a luxury for somebody like me to just focus exclusively on the principles and at what point am i and at what point is it safe for me to just theorize about my principles and what matters and the good life kind of stuff at what point do i need to stop and 
than just try to win or be a part of strategies to try to just win. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's very convenient uh, for somebody who's privileged to be able to sit there and like focus on the principled side of things. And I'm not saying that that's what you're advocating, but I feel like that maybe my tendency, and maybe I'm just trying to be self-critical here, maybe my tendency is to focus too much on that principled side of stuff to the neglect of strategies to just fucking win. And so I'm I'm trying to correct maybe an imbalance in my thought process. That's kind of what I was thinking about today. Yeah, I certainly understand that. And I think, you know, anyone should have like that, um, that like dialectic in mind when they're, uh, working how, how to apply their principles politically, right? There's going to be some like dialectical tension that, that you have to negotiate and navigate. But that said, there's like, there's some weird academic intellectual guilt that I think some leftists have. Like the people who just sit in their armchair all day and think about lofty goals are not like middle class and lower class uh, adjunct professors and people who like, um, who worry about this stuff, right? Like this is like the wealthy elites class of the Democratic Party who actually does this whole like t- thinking about principles and the principle of democracy and negotiation and compromise and shit like that, right? Like that's where that problem is. <laughs> the over intellectualization and stuff exists, right? Yeah. Like the rest of us who are really worrying about this, like am I caring too much about my principles, not focusing on strategy um, and winning just to try to get the best possible scenario, you know, rather than just like, letting the perfect be the enemy of the good or whatever. It's like, no, you're not, dude. All you're really doing is you think that your principles motivate your desire to win. And that's good. And other people who are like you, who are just regular people who want a better world and aren't like these weird Machiavellian sycophantic Bateman types who just want to like, you know, reenact their political imaginations and the real world. Like they're fringe and they're weird and everyone thinks that they're fringe and they're weird, right? Right. And they're not motivated by principles. Their principles are like clothes that they put on that day to make themselves look good or whatever, right? Um, you, regular people are motivated to make a better world by their principles, what they think is good, what they think is right, and how they think people should live with one another. And a lot of people have like weird stuff that they include in that and some like racist stuff and some classist stuff and some like xenophobic stuff and sexist stuff that gets meshed in there. But ultimately, I think most people can be appealed to on the basis of these moral principles. And if that motivates your desire to win, that's the way you're actually going to win and make the world better. You're not going to win and make the world better through a different mode. I, I mean, maybe this is too simplistic and naive an outlook, but I think ultimately it kind of comes down to that. Hmm. Well, that's encouraging, if nothing else, that's for sure. It doesn't mean you're going to win, <laughs> right? Yeah. Definitely not. Um, there's too many, there's too many, the, the sycophantic and weird people have more power, a lot that's more. It. And yeah. that matters, but they work harder, right? Like they have, this is, that's their life. Like that's everything to them. Mm. The rest of us, like we also want to like watch basketball and listen to music and, <laughs> and shit like that. We got work to do, you know? Yeah. Um, okay. What do you think? Final thoughts on this? What, what does this look like moving forward? I mean, when is the election here? Uh, less than a year now? Less than a year. Yeah. Yeah. So can you believe that one year away from the election feels like the home stretch? <laughs> yeah, a fucking year, bro. It's so crazy. Um so uh final thoughts. What do you think? I don't know, man. I've rented a lot on this podcast. I think you should have the final thought. Well, I actually I don't know why, and maybe I just am naively optimistic, but I actually do think that Bernie Sanders is going to get the candidacy. I really do. And I'm going to say this, I do think that Bernie Sanders is going to be the next president of the United States. I do. I didn't think oh, so. I'm the beautiful soul. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think so in 2016. I didn't think he was going to win, or 2015, 2016. I didn't think he was going to win. Um, I was pretty convinced that, that I think that Hillary was going to win. That. I just kind of thought that she was fast tracked to the presidency. It just felt like it. I was obviously a Bernie supporter, and maybe I paid lip service to the idea that yeah, he could really do it. You know, he could really do it. But I don't think I I do. It it does feel, and it does seem from friends that I've spoken with and things like that that are out there campaigning and that are canvassing. Um, he is the most popular politician in America. 
There are tens of thousands of people on the streets in the United States, all throughout the United States. There are warriors online, and we can shit on online political activism all we want. There are people out there that are campaigning, that have been consistently campaigning, that have been fighting for his campaign, for creating a more decent country. And I do. I think he's going to win, man. That's my that's my hope. I really do believe it's going to happen. The issue then is going to be what does that mean politically in terms of the viability of a, a Sanders administration? Um, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there, you know. But I do think it's going to happen. Well, good amount. I want to end on that note because that's that's the good stuff. Yeah, man. I like it. I like it when you're hopeful, man. Yeah. I said earlier, you're like my Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> Like my conscience, man. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. By the way, I saw this really great cartoon of Pinocchio laying down on his back. And I think it was Snow White sitting on his nose. And she was saying, lie, not tell the truth. Now lie, not tell the truth. Because his nose was... Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so when you sent me that text message that said that I'm like your Jiminy Cricket, I almost sent you that back. And I was like, no, but that kills the mood because he was being sweet. <laughs> Does it kill the mood or does it enliven the mood? I yeah, know. I know. Depends I on the know. mood. What's the mode of the mood? The mode of the mood. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this shit up and move into the sticky leaves. Yeah. All right, sweet. So now it's time for that moment in the episode where one of us gets to talk about something that is giving us meaning in a world that is potentially a dark black hole, a, a hellscape, the hellscape of... The labor defeat. Troy, what is giving you meaning in spite of all of this? So I live in the South now. And I had never even, I think, really been to the South more than, or anywhere in the South for more than a couple of days before I started living here. So I wanted to find some ways to culturally sort of enmesh myself and get a feeling for what the South is like. Um, so I started to read uh, a series of short stories by Flannery O'Connor. Have you ever oh, read any yeah. O'Connor? Gosh, I have, and I don't know what. What are you reading? Uh, so there's a, a short story collection called A Good Man is Hard to Find, with the her most famous short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, is the titular um, entry in that book. But there's a, there's like nine or ten other short stories in the book as well. And I'm just loving reading this stuff. Like uh, One of my best friends um, in life was a huge Flannery O'Connor fan, and he always tried to get me uh, to read her stuff. You remember Trey, he was a huge yeah. um, literature guy and Flannery O'Connor was one of his favorites. I never, I never did it. I just never had time or whatever it was. Right. But I have some motivation now because I wanted to like read some Southern fiction, Southern Gothic fiction, right. And get a feeling Southern for Gothic, yeah. what it's like to be in the South. And she is just, um, she's just this amazing writer. Uh, and I love the, the short story mode. I've never really done a lot. I usually just read novels uh, but short stories are so great. Obviously, their their biggest virtue is that you can read them in one sitting, right? And just mm. in one experience, you get the whole thing. Sort of like how a movie can be one experience, right? Whereas novels are more like a TV series where you just kind of, you know, you can binge them or you can read them over a long period of time, but you kind of have to let it sit with you through different experiences, right? But a short story is just one isolated, unique experience. And that's super cool and interesting in and of itself, Right. And especially given the, like I've mentioned before in the podcast, I read fiction only at night right before I go to bed. Yeah. Um, and reading short stories in that way is great because I kind of sleep on it, like literally, right? Mm. Um, and, and think about it as I'm falling asleep and kind of uh, react to it and respond to it emotionally and stuff. And, and you know, O'Connor especially, um, you know, she was uh, writing in like the 40s and 50s and 60s. She died really young, like in her late 30s or something, um, which is tragic to think about all this great work that she did like when she was our age <laughs> um and she comes from a you know she's, she's from the south uh i think like georgia east tennessee uh area and um she's catholic you know very very committed catholic and her kind of uh catholic themes permeate her work but they're not surface level digestible mm -hmm. stories you know I, i've mentioned before one of my favorite quotes is that uh, about literature is that Umberto Eco said that a great literature uh, or a great novel is a machine for interpretations. And sometimes I think people get that wrong and they think that 
that just means great literature is ambiguous. That's not what it means, right? Uh, it just means it not that it can bear interpretations, but that it, it forces interpretations. It's machine for interpretations, mm. right? It creates the interpretations because of its like innate power as a piece of literature. I think it's an important distinction to make, and I think O'Connor is a really good example of that. Her stories. You read them and you sit back and you think, holy shit, that was super impactful and important. And I don't know why, but I got to think about it, right? I got to figure it out. Mm. For instance, a good man is hard to find. If you want an entry into O'Connor for the audience out there, just read that short story. It's super short, like 15 pages. It'll take you, you know, no more than half an hour to read. And it is an incredibly like violent and melancholic story and all the dark you know gothic shit that i love um while also having this like hint of the idea of maybe redemption or something or salvation is out there somewhere but it's definitely not here um it's so good and so impactful and her writing style is like it's it's like brutal and dark in one instant and then just like she'll reference like some like biblical prophecy or something and it's like flowery and poetic, and you're just like, holy shit! Like the the yin and the yang here is just like throwing me for a loop, and it's so effective. Have, um, it, have any of her works been adapted into like prominent films or TV series? I don't, I don't know. Maybe, but not certainly not recently that I'm aware of. Yeah, it, it really could be. Um, it'd be it'd be kind of hard, right? Because the short stories usually aren't. They don't flow in like the, this kind of structure that I'm, they could be adapted into a movie, really. Okay. They really would just be like maybe half hour, 40 minute uh, adaptations. And that's probably not a good market for that. Mm. It's also you know, dark as shit. So <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not appealing to everybody necessarily. <laughs> and it's amb- it, it, there's ambiguous amb- ambiguity to the themes, right? There, there, there's themes of like salvation, redemption, and sin and stuff like that. But they're not, they're not like right there on the surface for you to grasp. There's, there's a lot of meat there. They get to chew on. Um, but, you know, the, the best adaptation, I think, is, you know, Sufjan Stevens has a song called A Good Man is Hard to Find, where he takes the perspective in the song of the villain from the short story, who's called The Misfit, mm. um, and, and, and does the song through his perspective, which is just brilliant. So if there are great adaptations of O'Connor, maybe it's in music. Had so you, in had you read that story prior to hearing the song? Or is it now that, like, you're kind of filling in the gaps to that song now that you've read the short story. Yeah, the latter. I mean, I, I, th- that song came out in like '04. I've known about it for you know forever. Okay. Uh, and Sufjan's one of my favorite artists of all time, and that song's always meant a lot to me. And now it just means infinitely more. Wow. <laughs> uh, and that's not my favorite short story from that collection necessarily. I'm not sure what my favorite one is, um, but it's it's certainly like the most immediately impactful. Like if you want a sense of O'Connor and you want to be like struck the first time you read somebody, that's probably the best one to go to. Hmm. Okay. Well, damn. I am still in my Whitman. Uh, I just finished Poem of the Body today. So I got- Yeah, very different than O'Connor. Yeah, I'm sure. (laughs) But that actually sounds really good because I've been thinking, I've got like a little stack on my desk um, of, I guess I would call it casual reading stuff, which is like right now it's been a lot of poetry. Um, it, it's been exclusively Whitman for the last like two months, but I've been thinking that I don't want to dive into like fucking T.S. Eliot or something like that, which is one of the collections that I have on my desk. Um, <laughs> so that might be kind of nice, actually. I am literally writing yeah. it down right now on my to do list to get a collection at a bookstore here. Yeah, it's an interesting like I, mean, I don't know what kind of resonance uh flannery o'connor has in like literature circles today or in popular culture today i don't think much although i could be wrong about that i'm not enmeshed in that in that circle uh all that much but there's something to be said i think for a lot of the themes in her work and there's there's some problematic themes as well i mean she's from the south in the 40s and 50s right like there's there's going to be some some issues you have to deal with but um but it's certainly i think different than certainly than the literature of her time um, in a way that I think can really can really resonate with people um, mm. now. And maybe if you don't have any sort of like religious upbringing or anything, a lot of those themes don't mean anything to you. Mm. Perhaps I mean this may just be you know like uh, candy for for people like us. 
but um, but I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit more optimistic that everyone has um, can resonate with these themes, uh, even if they don't have a spe- as specific a history with it as as maybe I do. Mm. Is the leftovers? Would you consider that Southern Gothic? I mean, there's definitely a lot of Gothic themes, right? There's, I think the difference is leftovers has a little bit more of that like absurdist, um, like mystery element to it, yeah. right? In addition, which is what makes it really kind of unique. Right? You combine some of the gothic elements and the tragic elements with like this really absurd, almost comedic sense. It's very um, like 21st century in that way. Right? What about like Faulkner? Like almost getting to like Pynchon-esque stuff. Yeah. Is Faulkner, is that Southern Gothic? I haven't read Faulkner. Have I'm you? I'm trying to think. Or like, like maybe some of Cormac McCarthy's stuff, like Child of God. Because I'm trying to think, like I hear this phrase all the time and- like I'm like is to kill a yeah, mockingbird. Is that yeah. Southern Gothic? Like Cormac McCarthy certainly is. He's yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, he's next on my list of people to read, given that he's like the the great Southern writer of like the last you know generation or so. So I'm gonna go down that road soon. Have you not read McCarthy? Yeah, that's not, have you not read him? No, I had never have. Oh my! I've have you? Oh yeah, Blood Meridian was like fuck me, man. And then I read Child of that's God. That's supposed to be his, his opus, right? So. But I think Blood Meridian is my favorite of the three. Child of God is shorter, and it's pretty brutal. But um, and then the road is isn't all of his stuff pretty brutal. Yeah, it's all. But I mean, Child of God is. I mean, I don't know how much I want to give away, but it's about a, like a necrophiliac. <laughs> oh damn, that's so metal, dude. <laughs> yeah, bro, it's fucking brutal, man. But Blood Meridian is brutal, but it's gorgeous. Like I've never read anybody else who can talk about brains being splattered against a desert <laughs> sunset in a way that makes you like go, wow i want to see that <laughs> other than cannibal corpse of course yeah oh, there you go so <laughs> um well that's cool okay we'll yeah see. so Carmack mccarthy's next to my list i'm just gonna decide which book to read i would say blood meridian because everybody to be, yeah, the, everybody the reads one. the road and it's good it's really good but I don't know. I just and it's a it's a western kind of so you mm-hmm. know I don't know. yeah that's what I would say. Yep. Well, sweet man. Well, I so guess yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and read wrap some up Flannery the, O'Connor. Read some Flannery O'Connor. That's what we'll wrap up the episode on. A good recommendation. And what about that name? How come people aren't named Flannery anymore? That's, that's a, a great, great name. name. It is a great name. All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you again to John Litcrit guy. Check him out. Uh, he's on Twitter at the Litcrit guy. He's great. He tweets a lot and he writes a lot, and uh, he's a really good person to follow with regards not just to politics stuff, but also he does a lot of work on Gothic Marxism, which is where like his more academic mm-hmm. research interests lie. So check him out on Twitter. Uh, if you want to support our podcast. If you want access to bonus content, please go to patreon.com slash owls at dawn. You can find out how to get involved with some of our tiers there. We will be running the poll um, now. The poll should be open, actually. So if you are a patron, you can vote on the next patron-led topic. And if you're not a patron and you want access to that, you can sign up for the Democracy Motherfuckers tier or for the uh, Parliament tier, and you can get access to everything. And then... Next week is our final episode of the year and of the decade. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think pretty close to it. Is it or is there one more? Well, yeah, we, we haven't discussed if we're taking a break off for Christmas yet. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll probably take a break for Christmas. Probably take a break for Christmas. So I would imagine that next week will be the last one of the decade. Maybe, yeah, yeah, the last one of the decade. And we're going to do our special thing. Why don't you tell people what we're going to do? Yeah, so we're going to, I mean, it's just the, like germs of an idea, but we're going to ask each other some non-standard decade-related questions and uh, see what we come up with. That Hopefully it'll be interesting. Like, Austin, what was your most intense orgasm experience over the last 10 years? Oh, you stole my number one question. I know, man. I know you. Come on. Fucking <laughs> perverted mind. All right. Thank you so much. I think that's pretty much it, unless there's anything else you want to say. There's one more thing I can think of, dude. What's that? Das Vidania, Mary Konski. Yeah.